Nobel Prize for this discovery came to confess that a structure like DNA could never have emerged by chance. Professor Anthony Flew of England and Reading University is the world's foremost academic atheist over the last 50 years and the author of more than 30 books. His first debate with former atheist turned Christian, C.S. Lewis in 1950 in Oxford, England, was the first time he advanced his argument for atheism. He later wrote a paper titled Theology and Falsification. The paper became the most widely reprinted philosophical publication of the last half century and a key foundation for atheists and agnostics who advanced materialist evolutionism. But now it is the advancement of science itself that has changed the mind of Flew and some scientists. At a recent summit at New York University, Flew changed his position and now believes in God as the creator of the universe. Flew turns to various discoveries of science to prove his point. But it is the manifestation of life written in DNA and the transcription of DNA to RNA and RNA into protein and the subsequent process of protein folding that makes the best case for flu. Uh, what, what I think that the DNA material has done has shown by its almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which uh, lead to produce uh, this being uh, that uh, intelligence must have been involved in uh, getting these extraordinarily diverse elements um, uh, to work together. When you look at RNA, you, as, an, as a chemist, you just, you, you're, you're in sort of astonishment, really, at just what a wonderful molecule it is. It's complex, it's a really beautiful structure. And you inevitably wonder, how on earth did that structure arise? How on earth did chemistry produce it? RNA's structure looks simple but looks can deceive. Each building block is actually made of two parts, a sugar molecule and a nuclear base. Chemists found they could make the nuclear bases, and so when they then realized they could actually make the sugars, they just thought, we must be able to join them together. And so they tried for many years, but the problem was, chemically, you just can't join them together. Of course, such an amazing structure could never have been formed by chance. The theory of evolution, which sees life as the result of mere coincidences and haphazard happenings, is helpless to explain anything in the face of the incredible complexity of DNA. Some evolutionists say that our DNA is about 98% similar to that of apes, and that this difference is only a few spelling mistakes. Others say a more accurate figure is no more than 95%. But considering that humans have 3 billion letters worth of DNA information in each cell, even a 2% difference is actually 60 million spelling errors. Of course, this is not error, but 20 500 page books worth of new information. A common designer is a much better explanation for the similarities in human and ape DNA. As an architect uses the same building materials for different buildings, we shouldn't be surprised if God used similar design features in many different creatures. After all, we do share about 50% of our DNA with bananas, but that doesn't mean we're half banana. Every detail of a living being's physical and physiological makeup is coded in this double helix. All the information about our bodies from the color of our eyes to the structure of our internal organs and the shape and function of our cells are programmed in sections called genes in the DNA. The DNA code is made up of the sequence of four different bases. If we think of each one of these bases as a letter, DNA can be likened to a data bank made up of an alphabet of four letters. All the information about a living thing is stored in this data bank. If you found an ancient clay tablet with strange characters washed up on the shore, you couldn't read it, unless someone had cracked the code. But you'd still know the letters represented a language, even if you didn't know anything else about the author or his civilization. Language is recognizable, even if you can't read it. Take Morse code. It has three basic parts, dots, dashes, and spaces. These three simple parts are combined.
to represent letters. There are 26 letters in the English language, which are combined to form over 400,000 words. Those words can, of course, be combined into an infinite number of sequences or sentences. There is evidence that DNA represents a language. Four basic units, called nucleotides, combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Even if you can't read DNA, it still has all the hallmarks of language. A language that biologists are just now beginning to crack. Every tiny cell in our body is packed with three feet of DNA, three billion nucleotides. The similarity between DNA and human language is uncanny. In addition to codes, both use similar techniques to pack, access, rearrange, copy, and translate information. DNA seems to represent a language, the language of life. An unseen author, the creator of heaven and earth, has left a testimony of his existence in the DNA of every living thing. The information that is stored in, in the DNA molecule is pointing back to, an, to a designing intelligence. Now, why do I say that? Um, it has to do with what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. Uh, our, our local hero in Seattle, uh, Bill Gates, says the DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever created. And that's a very suggestive remark because we know that programs always come from programmers. And in fact, we know generally that information, whether it's in a computer program or a hieroglyphic inscription or in a headline in a newspaper or uh, a block of text in a book, information always comes from an intelligent source. So yes. when we find information in the DNA molecule, the most logical thing to conclude is that it too had an intelligent source. An intelligent source. Due to this primitive level of science at the time, the imaginary scenarios of the theory of evolution were not looked upon as odd at all. Darwin's theses had a great impact on the scientific circles of his day. However, Darwin was still distressed. In the chapter, Difficulties on Theory, he wrote, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. As far as I'm concerned, I'm here to tell you, Michael, this morning and Jason, evolution is dead. Long live the creator. I'll tell you why. And I'm saying science says that as a scientist. Uh, evolution is dead because there's such thing as the minimal gene set concept. They've taken a mycoplasma, smallest organism, mycoplasma genitalium, which is the smallest organism that is known to exist, has 468 genes. A genes is a mix of uh, proteins, right? Mm -hmm. a, a list of, so it can be a thousand, can be ten thousand amino acids. Okay, they're 486, and they've decided since year 2000, they've said, let's take them, let's try to reduce it. Because we have to start, if you're going to be an evolutionist, you have to start with zero genes and build up if you're going to go from hydrogen to human. And so, somewhere along the way, they said, well, let's take it down. In the year 2000, they published that even on paper, they couldn't go below uh, 200 genes. In, on the 6th of January, 2006, in Nature, they published that in reality, you could only go down to 397 genes. So, so, so a cell, which is where my specialty lies in my, my uh, scientific work, a cell needs a specific number of components to be functional. You have a membrane, but then you need to feed the membrane. So you have to have some mitochondria. You need a way of tagging the proteins. You need some DNA. So you need 397 things. Just the glucose cycle for getting en uh, energy takes over six different genes. So if you don't have one of them, you don't have any more energy coming to the cell. Darwin's fears proved to be true soon after his death. The laws of inheritance discovered by an Austrian botanist, Gregor Mendel, caused Lamarck's and Darwin's assertions to collapse. The science of genetics that developed at the beginning of the 20th century proved that it was not acquired physical traits, but only genes that were transmitted to subsequent generations. This discovery made it clear that a scenario suggesting that acquired traits accumulated from generation to generation and generated different living species was implausible. In other words, there were no inheritable variations for Darwin's proposed mechanism of natural selection to choose from.
Subsequently, the theory of evolution as advanced by Darwin has been collapsed early in the 20th century. All the other efforts by evolutionists in the 20th century could do nothing but only confirm that natural selection had no evolutionary power. A famous evolutionist, the English paleontologist Colin Patterson, admitted this when he said, No one has ever produced a species by mechanisms of natural selection. No one has ever got near it. And most of the current argument in neo-Darwinism is about this question. When it was clear that the mechanism of natural selection proposed by Darwin had no evolutionary power, evolutionists had to make a fundamental change in the theory. In addition to the concept of natural selection, they added a second mechanism called mutation. Mutations are alterations or distortions that take place in the DNA of living beings, mostly as a result of external effects such as radiation or chemical action. The theory of evolution now holds that living things are differentiated from one another and develop as a result of mutations. This cannot be true, for mutations only damage the information in the DNA and give only harm to a living being. No beneficial mutation has yet been observed either in nature or in laboratories. Since mutations do not add new genetic information, it is impossible for living beings to acquire new organs through mutations. Is new information being generated? That's what evolutionists have to come up with. Right. They have to have a mechanism that generates new, never before existing genetic information right. that can build all these bigger and better structures. Right. That, uh, that supposedly never existed before. Right. Right. Never before existing information. In, in, back when, the, when there was only a single cell that gave rise to all the diversity of life, there wasn't information. Right. for skin and hair and heart and a brain and so on. Right. So you have to generate it somehow according to evolution. Right. Now Dr. Werner Gitt is an information specialist. Since we're talking about information, mm -hmm. we'll go to an information specialist. Okay. He wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information that you and I both, uh, both love. Mm -hmm. um, and in his book he says this, a code system is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intelligent origin or inventor. Mm -hmm. It should be emphasized that matter as such is unable to to generate any code. All experiences indicate that a thinking being voluntarily exercising his own free will, cognition, and creativity is required. Right. He goes on to say, there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Right. This is why Professor Richard Dawkins, one of the most renowned advocates of the theory of evolution of our day, hesitates when he is asked to give a single example that increases the genetic information. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? The truth is very evident. Life has such a complex design that can never come about by chance. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Richard Dawkins is his name. Uh, arguably the world's most famous atheist. I don't know how you would test for that, but uh, maybe we'll ask him. So, uh, right off the bat, what's wrong with, in your opinion, with believing in a god, regardless of who the god is? I think it's false. Uh, I think that it's um, a matter of belief without evidence. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence.
from elsewhere. Muhammad is a messenger sent by God to give the Quran to mankind.